have your Bibles, turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 107. Psalm 107. Leave them open right there because we're, we're going to outline this entire chapter. All 200 verses that no, I'm playing. Um, when I was coming into this service or preparing for the service this week, and, and of course Thanksgiving on your mind, one study led into another study, which led into another study, and I began to unearth some things I didn't realize. So I want to share those things with you today. And we're going to begin in Psalm 107, and I'm just going to begin by reading verse 32, but then I don't know how it is or laid out in your Bible, so, but we're going to begin at the beginning. I'm just going to give you a quick, you're going to see four quick points in this, in, in this chapter of Psalm 107. Psalm 107 verse 32 reads like this. Let them exalt Him also in the assembly of the people and praise Him in the company of the elders. This morning I want to bring a message entitled The Power of God During Transition. The Power of God During Transition. You may be seated. As anticipation builds over the thoughts of a Thanksgiving meal. The calories we will consume and the regret later that evening. Let us not forget the reason why we are gathering together. It was 400 years ago this year that the Puritans fled Europe in hopes of establishing a colony in which they could freely worship God. Many sacrificed families, inheritance, family fortunes, and, and, and in order to do one thing, to have the freedom to simply worship God. Their sacrifice and adventurous spirit led to the founding of this great nation and ensured that future generations, us, would have the same liberties and freedoms that they richly established. You see, many of us right now, we view men such as Washington, Adams, or Jefferson as our founding fathers. But we must never forget that those men and men like them stood on the foundations laid by Winthrop and Bradford. William Bradford was met with much hardship most of his life. At an extremely young age, he would lose both parents and found himself an orphan tossed between relatives' homes. While staying with an uncle, he found solace in a small church in which he could hear the Word of God proclaimed. And as that Word of God was proclaimed, he would, he would note how it gave him peace and gave him comfort as early in life it seemed as if he struggled and, and everything beset him. Bradford found himself and his wife aboard the Mayflower, heading towards the New World. Though the seas were treacherous, Bradford would use the Word of God to console its passengers. In fact, it was noted that he often read Psalm 107, the passage of Scripture which describes difficult times in the life of an individual or even nation but it exhibits the power of God working through any circumstance or any situation. In fact, Bradford, it says that he emphasized the verse 36, our opening text this morning, and he would use that to remind the people that God has not brought them this far to forget them now. And that their responsibility was to praise God through the storm. Deuteronomy 28 verse 8 reads in this manner. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. And He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The words of Bradford and Winthrop, though many have turned a deaf ear to them, are resounding throughout this nation today. You see, the passages they were inspired to pronounce over this new nation, 
It set a course of action and a course of direction. Not only for this nation, but it set a course of action in God's response to this nation. See, though Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and New York City are prominent in the minds as many because that is where our founding documents and our first presidential inauguration were conducted. It was the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the ground on which it was founded. The Word of God and the prayers that were pronounced in that land and in that colony that set the course of action for this nation. It stands to this day as the grounds of consecration for the United States of America. You see, upon the establishment of this new nation, those words and those prayers established a holy nation dedicated to a higher purpose than any other nation on the face of this earth. The ground of this nation was consecrated. It was dedicated to God for a sacred purpose. And it all began with the Massachusetts Bay Colony and William Bradford as he spoke that word. I want us to understand this morning, and I I do not have time to go in great depth over this teaching. I want us to understand what is actually occurring and happening right now at this time. We are currently, as a nation, and I'm talking about the entire nation, not the body of Christ, it has been exactly 400 years since William Bradford read Psalm 107 through the passengers of the Mayflower. And here we are, exactly 400 years later, uncovering this same text today. It has been 400 years since it was first spoken over a people and over a nation. But not only of a people and a nation, but to establish a ground of consecration. You see, the reason this year has been in such an upheaval is because we are in a 400-year cycle. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was established in 1620. We are now in 2020. That is 400 years. Let's look at it in light of Scripture. There is a pattern in Scripture that establishes a 400-year cycle with the nation of Israel and the Hebrew people. And every 400 years, a major transition happened in that nation and with those people. It began when God was speaking to Abram in Genesis 15, in which He would talk about a time in which his descendants, his, those who are far off, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there might be a time in which they would turn away from God. And as they turned away from God, God said that they would fall under, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but the imprisonment or the control of another people. And that 400 years or four generations would have to pass before they would be released from that bondage. And upon being released from that bondage, God says, I will carry them to the land that I have promised you. Because it has been set aside for you and for your people. But only after 400 years have passed. So that began, began when exactly did this cycle begin? Well, we know that these people turned away from God, the Hebrew people. They went into Egyptian bondage. And as they went into Egyptian bondage, 400 years passed before God sent Moses, worked through Moses and Aaron to deliver His people and to set them free. And to lead them to the land of promise that God made to Abram. 400 years, major transition. 
400 years the establishment or the change of a nation. Grounds of consecration. In Psalms 107 verse 4, it says that they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. I'm, this morning as I break this down, this is the only way I know to do it. I'm going to show you the four imageries in Psalms 107 that Bradford would have pronounced to the people, but God left for us in His Word. The first being this, Psalms 107 verse 4. Because it speaks of a traveler who has lost their way. It speaks of a, and when you look at the verb usage within this text, it gives the understanding that the traveler just did not lose his way and get back on track. What you see in the verb usage is that it is a reoccurring practice by the traveler. In other words, he may lose his way, get on track, but it's not long that he loses his way again, gets back on track, loses his way again. You see, he may find the correct path and walk for a distance, but he finds himself constantly getting lost or losing his way. For a moment, think about the place in which the traveler is lost. Scripture here indicates it is a wilderness or is a desert. A place that is dry, a place that is barren. Where you could scream to the top of your lungs and no one will hear you or answer you. Ultimately, it is a place of solitude where you are alone and isolated from the rest of the world. You see, though the indication is of someone who is lost physically, we can lose ourselves and feel as if we are perishing, growing faint and growing weary simply by the cares of life. See, there are many who have now found themselves wandering aimlessly because the cares of life have stricken them and they have now succumbed to themselves and to the, and to the desert mentality. What happens during a time of transition is that we, if not careful, we can easily lose ourselves and who we are in Christ Jesus. But most importantly, even as we see time approaching, we can actually lose our way. You see, it was through the wilderness that the Lord Himself brought His people to their promise. It was, it was during the wilderness experience that God, or they saw God move in ways that they would have never had experienced Him in Egypt. And it was in this wilderness that they saw the glory of God descend down on a mountain. Folks, what I'm trying to tell you this morning and what I've been imploring for some time. Now is not the time for us to lose our way. That we may find ourselves in a desert. Because in the desert is when you'll see the glory of God. In the desert is when you'll see God move. In no other way that you'll ever see Him move before. You see, it was after the 400 year cycle. And I heard this as I was studying this out. And I was putting together the 400. I, I, I'm telling you. A message, it, just, it was just in the next segment of, of, of the YouTube things I listened to, and it pops up, and this preacher is now talking about the 400-year cycle himself. And so I thought to myself, I better stop and listen. Because I'd already been led to the 400. And he made this observation that I did not put together. He said that after the 400-year cycle, and I want you to recall everything they seen. They seen the plagues in Egypt. They seen God part the sea. They cross over. Pharaoh's army destroyed. They seen God move. You see, they were only supposed to be in the wilderness basically for two weeks. Because God had carried them to the other side. They were now standing at the precipice of going in and claiming the promises of God, uh, the land that God had told, told Abraham about. Hey, after four generations of 400 years, I'm going to carry you people to this land. Here's the observation that pastor made, and I never put this together like this. And I don't know why, it's obvious. Here they are after the 400-year cycle. They're now standing on the edge of the promise, and what did the people do? They cast a vote. Don't miss what I'm telling you. Remember, they sent the spies into the land. Joshua and Caleb come back and said, Man, there are grapes as big as bowling balls over there. 
There is land plentiful just as it was spoken to Father Abraham. Yes, there's giants in the land, but we can kill them giants. We can take the land because God's going to give us the land. But there was ten other people. Oh, no. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're going to squish us like a bug on a windshield. We can't do it. We, 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 we'd have been better off to stay in Egypt. We'd be better off to wander around in this desert. So they cast a vote. And at the vote of the people, they lost the promise of God and they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 more years. See, with all the noise that is transpiring at this time, you can get right to the edge. Let me back. I got, I got to back. And this is the only thing I'm going to say today about the election. You, we could talk all day long about everything that's going on, and it doesn't make a hill of beans. Because ultimately, God, and I believe this, God still gives people free will. And He gave us the opportunity to speak. And I said even before that, it depends on what God's people do. That's what Scripture says. If my people. You see, God told them, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to defeat your enemies. All you got to do is go claim it. But they put it to a vote. And they allowed what would appear to be the majority to speak louder than the two that had faith. And the majority ended up winning and everybody missed on the promise. See, that's what we cannot miss about everything that's going on. We might say, oh, well, well, this is what happened. Yeah, they got a bigger voice. Yeah. But who truthfully has faith? God asked the question, when I return to earth, will I find faith on the earth? You see, because of free will, God sometimes will allow us to have exactly what we've asked for. And that's why you better return to God. That's it about the election. But with all the noise transpiring at this time, we can become distracted and lose our way. We can become disgusted listening to all the other voices. Actually, the word, best word there is I would say disguised. Because we listen to every other voice under the sun except seeking God's voice. And except praying to Him ourselves and getting a word for ourselves. You see, we can easily miss the next turn and we can miss the next promise of God by not being vigilant concerning the direction in which God is trying to carry His people. What did He say in this first part about the traveler in the wilderness? Psalms 107 verse 6. It says that they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and He delivered them out of their distress. You see, it was as if, as if this were the main subject of the psalm. That when the people of God are in different circumstances and under various forms of trouble, He says, call upon God. And God says, I will hear you. I will hear your prayers. I will see your tears. He says, I am, God saying, I am the one who searches the heart. And I know the condition of your heart. And I know whether it's truthfully a prayer or if it's lip service. I truthfully know if that prayer has been offered in faith or are you doing it because that is the Christian thing to do? And God is saying, I am the one who searches. I am the only one who hears. And I am the only one who can deliver you from this wilderness and from you losing your way. You see, the psalmist in this text is given the idea of, a, of an individual who has been narrowed down. You're being compressed. In other words, a heavy weight is being pressed down on you. And it is beginning to, to the point, it is flattening or straightening you out. I think of the words that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. See, the only thing this world should be seeing and hearing from the church right now is not, woe, it, oh me, what's happening and what's going on. What the church and this world ought to be, what the church should be saying and the world should be hearing 
Oh, yes, I'm, look, I'm going through just like you're going through. But my God died for me. I'm pressed down just as you did, but my God has washed away all of my sins. He's now seated in the place of authority at the right hand of the Father. What are we manifesting to this world when we show this world that we're fearful? God's saying, you manifest the Lord Jesus Christ to this world and watch how I change this world. You watch how I bring people back to me. Let me tell you what that power is. That is the power of Jesus Christ manifested in the lives of believers in such a time as this. That doesn't mean life will be perfect. That doesn't mean that you won't have periods that you go through yourself. But what it means is that you can have a song in your heart. You can praise God. You can worship. You can have thanksgiving. Joy. All these things. Why? Because Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit of God, is living, working, and manifesting in these vessels to the honor and glory of God. Psalm 107 verse 9 says, For He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. You see, during times like this, and even, look, just a craving, it's only God that can satisfy that craving, that hunger, and that thirst. Think about the imagery of the wilderness, because that, that we're still in that context. He gives the imagery of somebody passing through a des desert that is hungry, starving to death, and they're thirsty because the arid air of the desert is, is just sucking the moisture right out of their body, sucking life right out of their body. God's saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for me. Everyone who is searching and craving for something to satisfy that craving. God says, I'm going to give it to you. But he goes further than that. He says, I'm going to give you my goodness. My goodness, he said, which is what? Good and well-pleasing. Well-pleasing is an old English term. And it simply means giving great pleasure or great satisfaction, especially to God, which means highly pleasing. So what is God saying? It is well-pleasing. My goodness is well-pleasing. How is it? Well, what is that? Well, it means that what I'm going through, it is more than enough. It is great pleasure. It is great satisfaction. And when that satisfaction, that pleasure, that goodness just really gets to stirring inside of you. You know, it, look, it's I, it, it just coming to my mind. Y'all going to have to bear with me today. I'm thinking of Thanksgiving. And we talked about them calories and them meals. And you get there, you eat things that you normally had. And that evening you got indigestion like you never had before. You're popping Tums. And, and everything else to try to get that indigestion down. I'm not talking about indigestion. What I'm talking about is the well of living water that begins to flow from the Spirit of God out of our bellies. That God says, when you hunger, when you thirst, it's not something to, to, to do away with uh, the effects of something else. It is my goodness and my pleasure that I keep pour, uh, pouring into you. It's my good, And what happens with goodness and pleasure begins to fill this vessel. It comes out in forms of thanksgiving, in psalms. It comes out in hymns and worship to God. Look, have you ever wondered when you find yourself in a time of distress and all of a sudden a psalm begins to come to your mind? What is God doing? The Spirit of God is giving you the song that's going to give you peace at that time. The Spirit of God is giving you an anointed song, a rhema song at that time that's going to bring honor and thanksgiving to God. See, God gives us His goodness so that we give thanksgiving and gratitude back to Him for all that He's done and what He's bringing us through. We move on to the second one quickly. Psalm 107.10. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons. The imagery here is that of somebody locked away in prison. So it gives the, the lesson or the, the, the understanding what happens. See, we've lost, you know, we talked about individuals who loses their way. Now we're talking about somebody who loses their freedom. You see, the imagery of the second reason to pray God. He says, I've got the power to deliver prisoners from chains and cells of darkness. See, I can imagine this text really spoke to Bradford and those aboard the ship. Because, see, they had witnessed family members' homes burned because of their beliefs. Others had experienced persecution 
in unlawful imprisonment by proclaiming Jesus Christ as the only means to salvation. Many had become martyrs for the sake of Jesus Christ, and that's what they were fleeing. They were fleeing that so they could come and worship God in liberty and freedom. You see, though our minds are immediately fixated on a physical prison, what about the darkness that comes from the absence of the presence of God? See, not only is it a place of isolation, but the chains around the hands and feet that begin to bind an individual. Think about the misery inflicted as you sit in total darkness, no one to talk with, and you feel as if God is a million miles away. Bradford proclaimed this song to the people. And it forewarned future generations of the possibility of departing away from the presence of God. See, God has called, and God is still calling people to come to Him right now. See, what we have become as a people is vastly separated from the people who set our course, the grounds of consecration. The pride and rebellion and obstinance of heart of people are in a purging process. That's why we're witnessing what we're witnessing this year. And the purging is due to the fact none of those things are a characteristic of our God. See, though the people once again were being released by Cyrus and given a mandate to rebuild the nation, many did not return. Let me tell you why they didn't return. Because they had grown accustomed to Babylon and the ways of Babylon. You see, they had grown accustomed. They, they liked the food. They liked the clothes. They liked everything that was going on. The, the, the Babylon, there again, once again, represent a worldly system. And many never returned back to the land to rebuild and back to the promises of God. And they grew to love the confines of their imprisonment. You see, we have yet to see what direction this nation is getting ready to turn. One of two ways. But it does reveal that Babylon is in the heart of the people. In Psalms 107 verse 10 it says, Those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death bound in affliction and irons. You see, this verse simply does not speak of bondage. But when we begin to dig deeper, we receive out of this a messianic prophecy. Prophecy speaking of Jesus Christ and what He would do. That prophecy is found in Isaiah 9, verse 2. It says that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, there's your key word, your key phrase, shadow of death. Upon them a light has shined. You see that phrase of shadow of death, it will begin to really open that text and the prophecy for us because it speaks of a land of corruption. So let me just reread it real quickly with that in place. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of corruption, upon them a light has shined. You see, the Messiah is arising with His new light. And it's beginning to expose the darkness on this planet. The Babylonian system. The pride and rebellion in people's hearts. And that is why we're seeing a lot of people That is why you're seeing rebellions, riots, looting, those things happening. That is why you're seeing rebellion within the church because as God's light begins, as His light begins to shine in this present darkness, Scripture says it becomes an offense. It makes people angry. It upsets them because God is exposing something within them. And He's bringing it to light. See, God has given this nation, He's given the people every opportunity to go to the secret place and to, and to ask God to forgive our sins as a nation, as a family, and as a people in private. But because this nation did not do it, it is now will be put on public display. You see, the Messiah says will truly appear with the light of grace and consolation. 
And who shall receive Him with the greatest joy as attaining the summit of their hope and of their desire? You see, what's beginning to happen in Scripture teaches that there will be many who will fall away from the faith in the end of the age. Some are going to fall away. Many will fall away. But few are going to find consolation. They're going to find hope. They're going to find desire. They're going to find joy. Because they realize God is working on them and working through them to perfect them into the bride that He's coming back for. They realize that the light, though yes, it exposes things, they fall on their knees before their God and realize, God, I'm not perfect. And I have fallen away from you. Or I've drifted away. And this system is, is pulling on me. And God, I need to come back to you. I need you to forgive my sins. And then goodness, that desire, that joy comes. You see, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all about being in prisons and bars. Because God says, I've made a way of escape. What does He say? Verse 16. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron or the bars of iron in two. You see, God breaks open the prison doors for those who turn to him. He releases you from your confines and from your isolation and brings you into his presence. He releases you from those things that have weighed you down and continue to drag on you. He breaks the shackles and the chains. By simply just turning to Him and asking Him to be your God. Scripture says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And not submitting to God is forfeiting your rights and your freedoms. Remember, God sent Cyrus, a pagan king, to sit and to liberate His people. Some accepted it and others did not. What did they choose? They chose to remain in bondage. Verse 17, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Notice the traveler who loses his way, the prisoner released from prison. What happens when you lose your help? You see, he says he delivers the fool from their sickness. A fool, in the sense, they are perverse. And they depend solely upon their own wisdom. Individuals who are deliberate and and, and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable or unacceptable, often in spite of the consequences. I believe we can all agree that that sums up this nation at this moment. Despite the outcome, people want to do things their way. Despite the co- whatever the consequences may be, they defy God by standing and cheering when abortion bills are passed. As this nation was formed on biblical principles, its foundations and grounds of consecration were spoken from the Word of God. We have seen a rapid spiritual decline within this nation. Once again, I refer back to that that message that I heard the other day. His words, because he he went to the same text or or texts like these earlier on. He began a 400-year cycle in the year 1607, 1608. Why would he begin a 400-year cycle then? That was the founding of the Jamestown Colony. His words several years ago, even before 07, I mean years before 07, 08, he would begin to speak how in, because of a 400 year cycle, 07 and 08 would be the mark of a spiritual decline in the United States of America. If you will notice, 07 and 08 is also an election year in which people cast their votes. During that year, is when President Obama ascended the highest office in this land. Scriptures have been been linked as following the pattern in Scripture 
that there arose a king who knew not Joseph. In other words, a leader who would not worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in 07 and 08, we had a president elected that did what he could to remove God from the White House by covering the engravings of Scripture up from the White House. He did what he could in establishing Islamic worship in the house of the, of the people. He did not know the God that established this nation and the grounds of consecration that were spoken in the words and the psalms that were sung over this nation at its inception. And during that time in office fell under a 400 year cycle. And it initiated the spiritual decline of this nation. And I believe if you'll take the time today and really sit down and contemplate everything that has gone on, you will agree somewhere around 07 and 08, even though things did happen in the past, I get that. But you'll see in 07 and 08 a tremendous spiritual decline away from God and towards Marxism began in 07 and 08. In verse 18, it speaks of the gates of death. These gates led to Shoal, the land of the dead. You can find those references in several places in Job, but also Isaiah. Scripture says that God heard the cries at the gates of death, and He stopped them at the gates and permitted them to live. You see, what began to happen is they began to cry out to God, and they began to praise and to worship, and as they were being led down, they did not deserve to live because they were on their way to the gates of show. But the grace of God permitted them to live one more time. You see, we may view our current condition as hopeless and trouble on every side. And when we weigh out the options, we may say nothing good can come out of either path that we take. But when God's people cry out for help. It is God alone who can stop us and stop this nation at the gates of death. It is God and by God's grace that can say you don't deserve it, but I can stop you right there one inch or one second before you cross that threshold. And God is saying, yes, you don't deserve it, but because of my grace and because of my mercy, I could change that outcome. You see, we may think that everything is dead and everything is lifeless and all hope is gone. But God's saying at my word, I can stop it and I can speak life back into it one more time. Look in verse 20, the first half. He sent His word and healed them. See, God's Word is like a medicine. But we have no fear of overdose. You can't get enough of it. And the more you get of it, the more you want it. The more you get in you, the better you feel. See, you don't have to buy it. It's free. God's Word can cure you of every sickness and any disease that you face. Some diseases are strong, so you might have to take a double dose. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what you're going through. But you can't get enough of this medicine right here. See, it's only... Look, here's the thing about this medicine. It's only effective if you take it. You can leave it sitting on the shelf and let it collect dust, and that Word does you no good. Because you got to get it in your system. you got to get it in, and it takes time for it to get into your system. And when it gets in your system, and over time, it begins to affect you. It begins to change you. It begins to make you radical. It begins to make you crazy for God. It begins to set you on fire. And people don't understand why. Because God's Word is living and active. It's like a fire that is shut up in my bones. I want to be quiet, but I cannot because I feel like I'm going to die if I don't share it. You see, that's the medicine God is trying to get His people to take. Take my word, get it off the shelf, but take it as directed. He says in the last half of verse 20, He says, and deliver them from their destructions. You see, you take the medicine. God says, I'll deliver you from, what is the destructions? It is graves, 
in which they had almost fallen into. Like leaving open graves on the ground. You see, at His Word, it affects... His Word has effects on sin and on the person. And those sins are removed from that person. Paul writes in Corinthians, O death, where is your sting? And O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we take the mess and we take the Word. It helps us to avoid these open pitfalls and these open graves, these places of destruction. And he says that my people will have victory in and through and only by the name of Jesus Christ. Not just from sin, but from everything that you face in your life. We have the the victory over the sickness of sin and the effects of sin and how that does on our body. But we have victory when everybody else is down and out. You see, from our sickness, we can recover from our illness by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. That is why I told you this morning, we got to begin breaking jars and letting it out. Because it's by our testimony, by our praise, and by our worship, that's when you'll begin to win the victory. That's when joy begins to flood your soul in the goodness of God like you've never experienced before. It's time to open these vessels and let it out. God says we are alive because we are in Him. Verse 26. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. Here's the final imagery and reason to praise God, and it differs from all the rest. You see, in the previous two, the people suffered because they had turned away from God themselves. They chose that path. They had broken His commandments and His statutes. Here is the imagery of a sailor. And as a sailor in a ship, he has no control over the storm that he finds himself in. He can have the best ship with the best sails, the best rigging, and have all the knowledge. And he can do all he can on that ship, gird it up underneath with cables to keep it from, from breaking apart. It's what they used to do back then. He could do all these things. But he still does not have any control. The sailor did not create it, and the sailor did not speak the storm into existence. He simply found himself in the midst of a life-threatening storm that almost destroyed him. I believe this is the one case that I feel from a lot of people at this time. Because many are questioning what happened. We've prayed and we've fasted, and seemingly there have been no results. Chaos is ensuing all around, and I didn't ask for it. I simply found myself in the midst of, of, a, ter- of a terrible storm, in the midst of, of upheaval. It appears as if, as if something does not change, then I am done for, and I didn't ask for this. This is not what I expected or how I expected everything to turn out. I believe if I asked for a show of hands at this time, probably everybody here would raise their hand because you've experienced that sometime or you may be experiencing now. See, that is where most people feel when they view the world or they view national events. All of us at times have gone through seasons in our life when the unexpected happened and it took us by surprise. The issue with the sailor, he did all he could do But it reached that point, it was out of his control. And in the midst of the sea, it seemed as if all hope was lost. What do we do when we've lost hope? How about a hopeless situation in which there appears to be no answer and no direction? Verse 29. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. You see, a hopeless situation, what it should do is deepen our dependency upon God. It should build our faith in God. A hopeless situation builds trust. We begin to learn to trust God with every part of our lives. That's why I've said it several times throughout this year. This is not only a year of transition, but this is a year in which God is not only drawing people, 
is building faith in His people to learn to trust Him with the outcome. He is the one who created the winds and the waves. He is the one and the only one who said, Peace, be still, and the seas stopped. Though the storms rage, be still. Though the boat is filling up and you're in knee-deep water now, be still. See, even though everyone is in a panic right now, God is telling His church and His people, be still and know that I'm God. Verse 30. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So He guides them to their desired haven. So what is God doing? We, we see upheaval. He's guiding His people to a place of safety. A place of refuge. That's what a haven was. It was a port that was uh, protected by winds and waves and storms. And, and so the seas inside the haven would be flat or, you know, for easy uh, access and sailing for the sailors. He says the haven is also a place of desire. You see, in the midst of the storm, these sailors knew about these havens and they just wanted to get to a haven. They desired that haven. You see, it's, it's a place in which we're no longer tossed about. It's a place in which you find peace and you find safety. And it's a place where fear no longer has a hold on us. And why is that? Because God brings us into Himself. Our God is the haven of safety in times like this. See, Scripture says that He brings us into His shadows. Under the pinions of His wings like a mother hen. God brings us and He is the safe haven during times like this. And God's saying, when you have lost hope, I am your hope. Draw unto me. And He will give us rest. I'm closing quickly with this. Verse 22. It says, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare His works with rejoicing. It has been recorded that when the pilgrims, and remember he's reading Psalm 107, they journeyed across the sea, they go through storms, they finally arrive. So they plan excursions, and they want excursions to go jet skiing and all that. They took excursions because they wanted to find a suitable place to build their village. William Bradford led one of those excursions. They finally found a place on a hill in which to make their village. A place which would be a good fort for a defensive position. And when they arrived at the crest of that hill, this beautiful place, the hill was covered with the bones of dead Native Americans. These Native Americans had succumbed to some sort of disease and it completely wiped the entire village out. This is where they chose to settle. Here's the point. What was once dead is now alive again. God brought life back to a place that had once only known death. Throughout the entirety of the song and the building of this community, the whole lesson and everything that follows each and every one of those points that I gave you is praise God despite the circumstances. Praise God for bringing you through when you've lost hope, when you've lost your way. When you've, had, when you've lost your health. He's saying, praise me anyway. The only thing that the pilgrims had to do was to offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise and worship their God with everything that they had and all that was going on. What is the purpose of a sacrifice? It is to draw closer to God. The sacrifice is the giving of ourselves Holy to God. All of us. All of who we are. Here's what it is. It is to show our gratitude for the bounties 
of God and for Him giving us His grace and His mercy. It is the power of God during the time of transition. 